Hello, how are you? Here we are, talking about Phil Road. Hello. Hello. In the 1970s, Villa Road in South London was a squatted street. Behind these doors, anarchists mixed with hippies and feminists. A primal therapy commune established itself across the street from a whole food cafe. And homeless single mothers rubbed shoulders with Marxist revolutionaries. This was a generation that wanted to change the world. Squatting was in its idealistic heyday in the mid-70s. In London alone, there were over 30,000 squatters, often occupying whole streets of abandoned houses, with hundreds of squatters living together in communities. In Brixton, the town planner's futuristic 60s blueprint for a new town centre had been shelved, and streets like Villa Road lay empty, stranded between the past and the future. Into this vacuum came the squatters. They were politicised and they were on the left. They believed in collective living and collective action, and they chose to live by their beliefs. We actually thought that we could produce a revolution. We could produce very radical change in the way things were organised. We could increase the power of, of ordinary people, of working people and so forth. We could reduce oppression, all those sorts of things. We thought all those things could be done at that time. We were trying to do them. It was a politicised generation. I mean, we were Marxists, I suppose. Dialectical materialism and historical materialism were phrases that tripped off the tongue. What would your ideal goal have been? My goal is always revolution. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. The idea was that people would organise and would rise up against capitalism and there would be a revolution. It was always a little bit vague about exactly <laughs> what form that might take in Britain, but, um, uh, uh, you know, a general strike, whatever. I mean, it sounds, and it was, uh, wildly utopian. But you believed it? Yeah. Practically everybody I knew was political in one way or another, and it was a, a moment in time where we thought we knew everything. He had incredible energy, there were things happening, uh, there'd been the miners' strikes, there were factory occupations, there were things that there was the black power movement in the States, there was the anti... and so on, you know, so there was, there was, uh, you know, something positive, which was that people were optimistic, people thought they could change the world, they wanted to change the world, and so there was a lot of activism around and obviously one of the areas was housing. So would you personally get the crowbar and be... Yeah, yes I would. We would go along perhaps late at night and get in the houses and get the um, electricity sorted out and then help the people to clear out the houses and make them habitable really. When we moved into the houses they had had 
um, council wreckers in them who had broken a lot of the fabric of the houses. They they broke the toilets and they poured concrete down them. Um, they broke a lot of the windows. They tore up floorboards and pulled down ceilings. And we all set to, to fix them. And when I look back on it, the sort of things we did were quite astounding. We Because they had poured concrete down the drains, it meant that you had to dig up the connection to um, the main sewers out in the street. We just used to dig up the whole lot and, and connect it up to, to the mains. What do you remember about that house, 39, when, when you got there? <laughs> How terribly filthy and it was. Mm. You didn't have any floorboards in the basement? No, no, no floorboards. There was an old guy who had shell shock. Called Tim living there. That's right. The basement was the... full of excrement because he was mm. he had mental health problems. It needed a lot of cleaning up. We went out skipping. And skipping was going around and looking in the skips that were on the streets and uh, collecting whatever it was you needed. And so that was, you know, there were two activities, skipping and wooding. Wooding was going out and reclaiming all the wood from the houses that were being demolished. And uh, you know, you, you, you basically built your environment. It, it winter, the ice was on the inside of the windows. Heating was like one bar, one of those long fires, mainly for bathrooms, I think. And we used to cook on that as well, <laughs> beans on toast and toast. Total fire hazard. I think the wine was totally bent and uh, you know, illegal, such so a gas was. It was, you know, and I remember seeing a huge rat <laughs> coming up from the basement at one time. Yeah, it was pretty rough. Perhaps surprisingly, in the middle of a black community in Brixton, the core group that colonised Villa Road were white middle-class graduates, mainly from Oxford and Cambridge universities. Zander Fraser arrived in 1974 with a fire in his belly and a degree in architecture from Cambridge University. Were you rich? No, I, when I, from the day I left Cambridge, I never took or asked for money off my parents, but. But yeah, am, am I from a uh, relatively well-off family? Yes. But again, you know, we go back to the spirit of times. The, the last thing I, I, you know, I felt it didn't make any sense for me to be ultra critical of my parents and their view of the world and then, and then sit there taking money off them. The people that I became friendly with and spent most of my time with were university graduates um, who found themselves on Villa Road, you know, Oxbridge, um, very uh, educated, very committed political leftist kids. Well, I was working class and not very well educated and I didn't know much about Marxist theory of blah, 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 you know, and uh, I do now, I have to say. So it was an education for me, really. I was from a very typically middle class background. I'd had a private education um, and then I'd gone to university so, and I probably sounded a bit posh. <laughs> In 1649, to St George's Hill, a ragged band they call the diggers came to show the people's will. They defied the landlords, they defied the laws. They were the dispossessed, reclaiming what was theirs. We come in peace, they said. Pete Cooper was a graduate from Oxford who chose to squat for political reasons. He lived at number 31, the most rigorously political household on the street. What were you doing? Signing on? Signing on. and I got a job briefly as a road sweeper, and I got another, which, which was great, because I got the, the, the blue council jacket, you know, which was sort of a worker's uniform. It was great, you know. I hadn't any career plan at all. I didn't really think in those terms. You know, I think actually people really seriously thought that the revolution was coming. We were a bit of an Oxbridge house. We were certainly a sort of student, yeah, ex-student house. Um, I would say that we were one of the sort of lefty houses rather than the sort of hippie houses. I wouldn't say that I was particularly taken by the politics of it or involved in the politics of it before I went to Villa Road. It was only really after I got there that uh, that started to develop. Before Cambridge, I went to Eton. It was a bit of an education in class consciousness for me, if you like. And I remember the second day I got there when I started, I was 12, 
1965 or 6, and there, there was a speech from the headmaster to all the new boys uh, who, who explained that we were, we were going we to be running the country and that we were at Eden uh, to learn how to do that. It seemed absurd, and, and that, so I'm sure I wasn't the only person who went to Eton, who, you know, got pushed in a, or went in a different direction. The sin of property, we do disdain. No man has any right to buy and sell the earth for private gain by theft and murder. They took the land. Now everywhere the walls spring up at their command. There were two influences on us, I think. One was obviously Marx. We were Marxists. We saw ourselves as Marxists. We were in things like Marxist reading groups and we studied Marx. But um, we were also influenced by people like Lang and Cooper um, and were into the, the, the death of the nuclear family. This rejection of the nuclear family was born of an intellectual analysis which saw the family as an essential unit of a capitalist society. We felt it was necessary or should be possible to have supportive, economically um, viable, emotionally uh, rewarding relationships, f familial sexual relationships with people without creating or commodifying, as we like to call it, commodifying the family unit. We, we had a lot of theories around the family unit being the building block of capitalism. These beliefs made life complicated at the Squatters Resource Centre that Paul helped to run. If people within a sexual relationship had or wanted to have an intimate physical relationship, whether it was sexual or not, with other people, then that had to be acknowledged and it had to both be acknowledged by both partners but also allowed to happen. It was agonising, because the thing was, you're supposed to say it before you do it, not just say, it, oh, come back, say, oh, by the way, I'm bonked Bill, uh, you'd, have to, <laughs> you'd have to explore the feelings you had, uh, the pressures, emotional and sexual on you and the other person with the group or with the people it, it directly impacted on before you did the deed. I mean, I don't know anybody who like thought they wanted to get married. I certainly didn't think I wanted to get married. Um, and I you know, consider myself proud never to have gotten married. And it is quite different again now. Um, but yeah, I mean, nuclear family, we all had come from, a lot of us had come from pretty uh, unpleasant nuclear families. And that does open up ideas for how you might live. It seemed that the nuclear family was really in crisis. And the, you know, the, the idea of a, of a stable couple having children was not really part of most people's experience in that particular uh, kind of sub-society, you know. Um, and it also implied a degree of uh, isolation from others. I mean, there was a great collectivist vibe at that time. How you live together was very much open to question, and I think we partly just out of necessity, but we tended to live in communes. Uh, and that seemed as if that was the way that that could work more generally in, in society. By the mid 70s, there were about 5,000 squatters in Lambeth, more than in any other London borough. Down the road from Villa Road was St Agnes Place, another squatted street, populated by Rastafarians and many members of the Workers' Revolutionary Party. Jane Halsall Dixon has squatted here since she was three years old and is one of very few squatters left in Lambeth. We're going up. Yeah. very small bathroom, which uh, is used by about 15 people at the minute. Um, 
this is kind of a, a bicycle room. Um, there's been, you know, a transient community of people who've moved in here and sorted their lives out a bit, got themselves together, possibly